have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Fifty years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King said those words right here on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. But he didn't get here alone. There was a coalition of religious and labor leaders who organized the march, and they were overshadowed by that riveting speech. The real purposes of the March on Washington have faded into history. We're going to tell you that story. Hello, I'm Joanne Williams, and welcome to this special edition of Black Nouveau. Nobody knew exactly what to expect on that hot and humid day in 1963. Would enough people show up to make a difference? Would there be violence? How would the nation respond? And would the goals of the marchers be met? The march of August 28, 1963 did more than fulfill my expectation. It was a almost a holy moment. It was a day where everybody was extremely joyful about being there, but knew what they were doing. We marched for, for, for access to housing. We marched for access to jobs. We marched for access to, to education. The thing that just will always be with me is the camaraderie and the, uh, of the people that were there. And to see that crowd, it was remarkable. White, blacks, Hispanics, Jews, Gentiles, all of us were right there. I had just never seen that many people in, in my life. And, uh, you know, I thought it was an extraordinary outpouring of people. It was the experience of being there and the sense of, of solidarity that we had in a common purpose that was really the most important. Let the nation and the world know the meaning of our numbers. We are not a pressure group. We are not an organization or a group of organizations. We are not a mob. We are the advance guard of a massive moral revolution for jobs and freedom. Leading that revolution and the march were two men who spent most of their lives fighting for human rights and economic justice, Asa Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin. Most people do not know that it, in fact it was A. Philip Randolph and his colleague Bayard Rustin who actually organized the 1963 March on Washington and it was in fact initially framed as a march for jobs. Randolph spent his career fighting for job equity. In 1925, he became the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. In the 1930s, he was successful in negotiating better wages for the Brotherhood with the Pullman Company. He would also lead the struggle to integrate and merge with other labor unions. Mr. Randolph's philosophy was that for African American people in general, that Organized labor and employment was the door to economic prosperity for us as a people. As he saw it, it was the only way, and so all of his efforts were focused on using that as a vehicle. However, social justice and civil rights were, of, in fact, a part of that. It's sort of, it's hard to separate them. Randolph's first proposal for a march on Washington came in 1941 to protest the defense industry's lack of hiring of people of color. That march was postponed when President Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802. It said the federal government would not do business with any company that discriminated in its hiring and vocational training practices. That then served as the model for the 1963 march on Washington, but of course, uh, Baird Rustin came in and gave it legs, I say. If Mr. Randolph brought to the civil rights movement the concept that you had to have mass action, Bayard was the genius of nonviolence and of the strategy that 
that, that made that possible. Rustin had become involved in the civil rights struggle in the 1930s. Rustin was a Quaker and a pacifist. During his career, he would fight for human rights, socialism, and nonviolence. An openly homosexual man, his sexuality was criticized by a number of people in the civil rights movement, but it did not stop his involvement. I met Bayard Rustin in 1957 when he was organizing, at that point, support for the Montgomery bus protest. Bayard and Mr. Randolph organized three marches before the 1963 march. In 1957, the, the prayer pilgrimage where Dr. King spoke, and it was primarily in support of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was just beginning to form, and the Montgomery boycott. The success of the Montgomery boycott would spark activism in the South. The Greensboro sit-ins began in 1960, and the Freedom Rides began in 1961. By 1963, many activists, including Randolph, were feeling that the time was at hand for something massive. He proposed the March on Washington. He made that proposal in early in 1963, um, at a time when the civil rights movement in the South was really uh, building up. There was the beginnings of uh, what would become the really mass protests in Birmingham. Uh, and a number of civil rights activists, most importantly Anna Arnold Hedgeman, uh, who was a black woman uh, uh, activist in the black women's uh, club movement, uh, she suggested that they combine their forces. So Randolph met with leaders from the major civil rights organizations. One of the important aspects of the March on Washington was this was a national coalition. And that's why its statement was so powerful. It's made up of all of the major civil rights organizations coming together that day. Often, you know, in the past they had operated in competition with one another for resources, for attention. Everything was put aside that day. It, it, it was only A. Phil Rinder that could hold this group together. In some of those meetings he would say, brethren, if you cannot say something good about somebody, don't say anything. And on occasion he would say, we come this far together. Let's stay together. While those discussions were happening, President Kennedy proposed a civil rights bill. President Kennedy didn't like the idea of a march on Washington. He, uh, when we met with him in June of 1963, and Mr. Randolph said in the meeting, Mr. President, we're going to march on Washington. And you can tell the body movement of the president, he started moving around in this chair. And he said, if you bring all these people to Washington, won't there be violence and chaos and disorder and we would never get a civil rights bill through the Congress? Mr. Randolph spoke up and said, Mr. President, in his baritone voice, he said, this will be a peaceful, nonviolent protest. And we're going to march on Washington. At the beginning of the march, when we started to plan it, there was hysteria that black folks could not gather on the streets of Washington without riots. But Rustin's meticulous planning would prevent that from happening. There was a very big effort to make sure that we had our own marshals and that they were nonviolent. Byrett um, had trained in New York um, more than, I think more than 150 black men who were members of two auxiliary groups. Um, the police department and the fire department in Washington in New York had auxiliary groups made up of their black officers and they volunteered to be the marshals. And Bayard had to train them in nonviolence. But the training was not needed. The crowds were well organized and orderly. But a number of marchers were worried because they had been threatened. I, I, do you know how it feels that every time your phone rang 24 hours a day there's somebody calling you a nigger? And you don't know who in the hell it is who so can't go over there and whip their butts. But you had to sit back and hold yourself together. You're going to be dead if you go to Washington, nigga. Freedom Now Movement, hear me. We are requesting all citizens to in move into Washington. In a period of six weeks, plane, the car, actual bus, organization to, to the people necessary. began. And we had hoped for 100,000 people, 150,000 people at most. But that was a conservative estimate. On August 28, 1963, more than 200,000 people participated in the Great March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Organizers picked that date 
because it was the eighth anniversary of the murder of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old black boy from Chicago beaten to death in Mississippi. His crime? Allegedly whistling at a white woman. It was also a century after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And it's no surprise that the March from Washington is scheduled a hundred years after the Emancipation Proclamation. This was a demonstration that clearly made this tie between the Emancipation Proclamation and the unfinished promise that that was given. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's one of the important things about the march, is that, you know, it's incredible that, you know, a quarter of a million people descended on Washington from all parts of the country. He played football, first at Ohio State, then at Marquette, where he received his master's degree. Ted Mack led the Congress of Racial Equality's Wisconsin delegation to the march. He brought buses from Madison, Milwaukee, and Racine. It was long, tiresome, but jubilating. Because when we got to Virginia and saw all of those buses with all of the as Dr. King would say, all the God children going to Washington. But one thing they're saying, Jim Crow, you dead. Vell Phillips and her husband Dale flew in from Milwaukee. At the time, she was the first and only African-American and woman on Milwaukee's Common Council. Her husband was the head of the local NAACP branch. I remember Thurgood Thur said, be sure to bring an umbrella and all like that, because it's going to be warm. But we forgot, you know, and we were on our way to the airport, and I said, we didn't bring an umbrella. But there were people who bought two and three umbrellas, and they were, they were generous with their blankets and their everything. David was Newby was a college student from Ohio. Years. I'd been working in Boston that summer, driving a cab, and I'd bought a small motor scooter to get around Boston, and I drove that, rode that motor scooter 400 miles from from Boston to, to Washington for the march. George Paz Martin was a member of St. Boniface Parish in Milwaukee. He was 16 years old. He remembers coming home from his summer job and... There was Father Gruppy standing in front of the house with a station wagon with, you know, half full of people. And my mom was upstairs on the porch said, you're going, come up, hurry up and get your stuff together. I had no idea what was happening. And I got up there and she threw some sandwiches in my gym bag and a little change of stuff and off I went. And uh, not until we were on the highway was it explained to me where we were going. Kurt Schmoke was 13 growing up in Baltimore. I, I remember that so many uh, men and women, uh, different uh, ages, Different socioeconomic groups this is the first time that I recall uh, seeing, you know, whites and blacks and Hispanics all uh, together. A lot of older women uh, were there, uh, and they were kind of the glue holding a lot of this together. My mother really wanted to come to the march. Um, she thought it would be important for me. Uh, I really didn't have a sense of historical significance, but I knew to do what my mother told me. More than 200 members of Congress attended the event, as did many entertainers and celebrities. The answer is blowing in the wind. Early in the day, marchers were treated to a concert which featured Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, Odetta, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Mahalia Jackson. 
Many of the Hollywood celebrities had flown in on a chartered plane from the West Coast, but no one came as far as singer Josephine Baker, who returned from Paris for the event. My favorite person from that day for the movie star, besides Ossie Davis, who was my own, was Lena Horne, because she refused to sit with the stars. She wore a simple outfit, and, and you probably can see her in some of the films. She was wearing a kerchief around her head, and she sat with the SNCC staff people. And when people came to interview her, she would say, I'm not the story. This is Joyce Ladner from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I want you to talk to her. After the march, CBS journalist David Schoenbrunn hosted a civil rights roundtable, a half-hour discussion on the march and its meaning for America with six of the celebrities who took part. To be in Washington today was for me an accumulation of a number of generations of black Americans who have been trying to appeal to the conscience of white supremacy. The march had 10 co-sponsors, all of them male, representing different religions, some labor unions, and the major civil rights groups. Each spoke to the crowd in support of the 10 demands of the march. Bayard Rustin read all of the demands. The first demand is that we have effective civil rights legislation, no compromise, no filibuster, and that it include public accommodations, decent housing, integrated education, FEPC, and the right to vote. What do you say? Along with the civil rights law, the demands included enforcement of the 14th Amendment, voting rights, and reducing congressional representation where citizens are disenfranchised, and a federal Fair Employment Practices Act. This was a law uh, banning discrimination in employment, banning any private employer or a union from discriminating against uh, a, a potential employee. Um, this was actually an aspect of the law that was not included in the original Civil Rights Bill that President uh, John F. Kennedy had introduced a few weeks before this. Um, but, but for most of the people participating in the march, this was the primary goal, to get the federal government, to get Congress to add a fair employment clause to the law. The demands call for desegregation of all school districts in 1963, an executive order banning discrimination in all housing supported by federal funds, and a National Minimum Wage Act. Standing before the Lincoln Memorial on the 28th of August, in the centennial year of emancipation, I affirm my complete personal commitment to the struggle for jobs and freedom for Americans. Attendees took a pledge promising to go home and continue to work for the goals of the march. One thing I didn't realize until I actually got to the march was the role that labor was playing in the march, and that became an important part of it for me. David Newby went on to teach at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama and worked with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He moved to Madison, got a teaching position, and joined the union. In 1994, he was elected head of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO. He retired from that position in 2010, but remained very involved in labor and civil rights issues. But it's quite apparent to me that the members of this honorable body, to put it in, uh, well, to put it in the terms of my commando friends, these cats are just too dumb, <coughs> just too dumb to know when they have something going for them. You know, things are, are, are it's, it's bad enough to have to deal with, with, with a bigot, but when you got a dumb bigot, Vell Phillips came back to Milwaukee and continued to fight for equality, especially for open housing. She broke down a number of barriers by becoming the state's first African-American judge and secretary of state. And as a 16-year-old boy from Milwaukee, it was my, truly my coming of age. George Martin became an activist for the civil rights movement, the Black Panther Party, and the War on Poverty. His strong belief in the philosophy of nonviolence sparked his work for human rights, peace, and justice. 
He joined the boards of Peace Education Fund, U.S. Peace Council, and has been a delegate to the World Peace Council. Ted Mack came back to Milwaukee and continued working with the Congress of Racial Equality. He helped to integrate the Pabst Brewing Company. In 1970, he became the first African-American owner of a brewery when he bought People's Beer in Oshkosh and developed other businesses. Rochelle Horowitz continued to work with Bayard Rustin in civil rights. In 1974, she became the political director for the American Federation of Teachers, a position she held until 1994. She is still a civil and human rights activist. John Lewis continued to march for civil rights, including the protest in Selma, Alabama. In 1987, he was elected to Congress from Georgia's 4th District. Kurt Schmoke became the first elected African-American mayor of Baltimore. He served as dean of the Howard University School of Law and vice president and general counsel for that historically black university. I feel as though my career was uh, really affected by uh, both the generation of people who organized and those young people who were there at the march. I was really, in some respects, I was still on the shoulders of that uh, uh, generation. After the march, the leaders took the demands to President Kennedy at the White House. President Kennedy invited us back down. He stood in the door of the Oval Office and greeted each one of us. And he said, you did a good job, you did a good job. And when he got to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, and hey, you had a dream. The atmosphere of the day of the march was as if the beloved community had been achieved. Two weeks after the march, however, this euphoria ended with a thud. And that was the, Burmi the, the bombing of the 16th Avenue Church in, in Birmingham. Four little girls died in that bombing. So everybody then got back to business and the period of euphoria was ended. The next year, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which included the Federal Fair Employment Practices Act. And in 1965, Congress would pass the Federal Voting Rights Act. If, if it hadn't been for the march, maybe, just maybe, we would have got a Civil Rights Act passed, but not as soon. Maybe we would have got a Voting Rights Act. I think in, in terms of the goals, it created some momentum that, that changed some laws. Uh, and for a period, there was a feeling of hope and, and moving along. Things changed because all of us changed. We became more aggressive, and we became more diversified we became more demanding. We often think of the, 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 the march as a sort of moral statement, right? We focus on Martin Luther King's speech as a tremendous moral statement, and I think a very successful one, as to the sort of the, the immorality of segregation and racial inequality. The Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity 100 years later. And what, what, it, what we forget is actually the march was not focused so much on making that moral statement. What the goal of the march was actually to, uh, to convince Kennedy and Congress that very strong federal action was needed to enforce that commitment. So it wasn't just enough for people to believe in racial equality, it was that we needed very strong laws to enforce racial equality. I think it, we had a spurt there when things were just going much better, but we seem to be backtracking. Not we seem to be, we are. And as far as civil rights is concerned, there are no final victories. I think that that's what people understand, you know, that we went from uh, issues dealing with uh, race to then gender equality, then the uh, disabilities, and then, of course, we, we've had um, uh, issues now with, uh, you know, uh, sexual orientation and, and these kinds of issues. Even immigration becomes a uh, civil rights issue. So the agenda uh, continues, it evolves, but I think we're a better country uh, because of what happened back in 
in 1963. The amazing thing in a way is that, that it happened at all and that those various organizations uh, could come together for such a massive undertaking that had such an incredible impact on this country, its politics and its ideals. Fifty years ago, a quarter of a million Americans stood up for freedom, equality, and economic justice. There have been victories, but the struggle continues. The leaders of the march wanted their voices to make a difference, but not just theirs. They wanted the voices of the 250,000 people who made the march on Washington to make a difference, too. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. If you would like more information about the March on Washington, go to www.mptv.org slash local shows slash black underscore nouveau. You'll find expanded interviews with the program guests and links to more information. We went down the streets in Washington, D.C., dress at our best. I had on, I'll say it again, I had on a mohair suit, Stacey Adams shoes, and no hat. When I marched out in, the, uh, in Washington. And I've never been so proud of being part of something like that. I feel like I was the luckiest person in the world that, 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 um, that Bayard did me a tremendous favor by saying, come along, help me make history. And, and, I, and I was able to help and do that. I, I, I know I'm a better human being because of the March on Washington. It instilled in me a greater sense of hope. We 